We were at Milton Hall. Headquarters was at Milton Hall. It was at Milton Hall that we were alerted. We were given all our equipment. We made the trip from Milton Hall to London, which was about 80 miles in a covered truck. This time, we thought that it was a dry run. We thought it was just a, a scheme. Once that we got to London, once that we got into this safe house or briefing house, we found out that it was the real McCoy. As soon as we, were being, we started being briefed, we found out that our job was to work with SAS. Well, in the past, we hadn't, we hadn't received any training to work with SAS or with OGs or with parachute troops. We were trained to work as a team of three. <coughs> a French officer, a radio operator, either an American or a British officer. We resented working with uh, SAS because uh, they were doing a little different type of work than we were. They were doing a work, type of work that, uh, that would, uh, we thought, give our, our position away, and uh, we were trying to work underground while they were working in the open. After uh, quite a discussion, and they, after they called up a couple of English colonels and one English general, they uh, asked us if we would please take this job because it was, a, it was a very important job. So we saw General Coney, who was our commanding officer, who was the commanding officer of the French Forces of the Interior, and uh, he told us that he wanted us to take it, so we took it. Well, from there, after being briefed, we went to the SAS camp. The SAS camp, we met Commandant Bourguin, who was to be our commanding officer. Or that is, he was the commanding officer of the 4th Battalion of SAS. The 4th Battalion of SAS uh, was composed of uh, purely Frenchmen. And most of the Frenchmen were from Brittany. And our mission was to go into Brittany to establish two bases, one in the northern part of Brittany and one in the southern part. And we were to organize what resistance we could, arm them, and attempt to cut Brittany off from the rest of France. Most of, as I said before, most of these uh, French parachutists were from Brittany, and they were going back into their home country. As soon as we got to the SAS camp, commanding officer asked to see me. I was the only American there. He asked me if I was American, and I said yes. He told me he didn't have a hell of a lot of use for Americans. Now he could act accordingly. He said that he'd had some trouble with the Americans. Americans had let him down and, and uh, North Africa. Oh, uh, it didn't start us off too good, but we took it. Well, we left that night. Uh, one thing, we had a little, uh, little argument with him. We wanted to put our packs in baskets because we had been trained to jump with our packs in baskets while SAS were jumping with their packs uh, on leg bags. And we'd never jumped with a pack on a leg bag. But he said, no, you get out of the plane somehow. So we just said, okay, and went up to the airport that night. And they brought us into a room where there were a lot of chutes and said, okay, put on your chute. It was the first time we'd put on our chute because before the dispatcher uh, would always help us on with our chute. So we managed to get into a chute and went out to the plane. 24 men got into the plane, into every plane, I think, 24 men. Made it pretty crowded. They were laying one on top of the other and everything else. Well, our trip was quite a uneventful. As we went over the coast, we picked up quite a lot of flack, but uh, we got out of that all right, and everyone seemed to more or less go to sleep on the way out. Pretty soon we came to the field, circled the field once, the lights were down there, and uh, the first 12 men stood up and uh, ran down towards the end of the tail end of the plane, and as soon as they came to the hole, they just fell through. It was a uh, it's not a way that we had been accustomed to jumping. We'd been accustomed to jumping in three and sitting right around the edge of the hole and when they would go, action station number one, go, well, we'd just go and it was very simple. Well, this was uh, something different. Well, when we started down, I think I was jumping number 13, uh, we picked up this uh, sack in our hands, weighed about 80 pounds and started down towards the tail end of the plane. And one of the men ahead of us, his static line fouled in the rear of the plane. The static line was flying around in the plane, so we had to we stopped the guy and finally got this straightened up and made another circle over the field and 
and uh, just ran down towards the tail end of the plane with a bag in her hand and just dropped through the hole. Well, they seemed pretty good to get out of the plane because there was quite a lot of tension in the plane. When the chute opened, having the sack in her hand, it nearly jerked our arms out of the sockets. But uh, we held on to it all right. We got about 100 feet from the ground, saw about, uh, looked as though about 10, 15 men were running to the spot I was going to land. And it was a very uncomfortable feeling because I didn't know if they were Germans or Frenchmen. And I had this sack in my hand, I couldn't get my pistol out. And the next moment I hit the ground, and when I hit the ground, I sort of rolled up in my parachute. And uh, all these bodies around there were jumping on top of me, trying to get me out of the parachute. And I didn't know what their intentions were. I couldn't get out my pistol. Finally, I found out that I, I heard them speaking French, so I knew they were Frenchmen. And, and uh, finally got untangled and told them I was American. And they started yelling and hooping and one thing or another. And I asked them to sort of keep quiet because in our training, we'd been taught to not to make too much noise at a reception committee. Well, they told us there wasn't anything to worry about. The Germans were far away, and I asked them how far, and they said two kilometers. <coughs> and, uh, I didn't think it was very far, but they seemed to think that was all right. So then we were brought up into the center of a field where there were about 50 men, 50 or 60 men, standing right in the center of a field. First thing I said to them, I said, uh, don't you think that we should move off to the woods or not stand right here in the field? And they said, oh, well, don't worry about it. There's plenty of protection around here. And some joker yelled out over in the woods and, hey, hey, Joe, you over there? And somebody hollered back. So everybody was yelling, and every once in a while somebody was shooting off a shotgun. So there's a hell of a lot of noise around. From there, after all the parachutists were grouped together, we were taken down to a farmhouse. Well, actually, there were about 300 people at this reception committee, men, women, and children. And uh, as soon as they found out an American was there, everybody rushed over and, well, they were kissing everybody. They were kissing them and lugging us around on their shoulders. It was a regular circus. And the girls were lined up five, <laughs> five deep to, to kiss everybody, and they had wine, champagne, cognac, one thing or another. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and they had big bouquets of flowers, and it was terrific. Terrific. Well, we made contact with a, with a, with a, with one of the leaders there. Everyone seemed to be the leader, but we finally got out the real leader and, and had him pick up all the containers because each plane that came in had uh, had brought containers with them. So we brought all the containers down to the farm and started opening up the containers. Well, the minute they saw, saw these arms, everybody was willing to march against this German garrison at 3 o'clock in the morning. About 5 o'clock in the morning, I think we... It was about 5 o'clock in the morning, we went to bed. We went up in this hay barn, up in the hayloft. Quite a few men people sleeping up there in the hayloft. So we went up there, the radio operator and this uh, French captain, myself, we undressed and got into a sleeping bag. As I get into a sleeping bag, I just get into my sleeping bag and a girl who was sleeping over here on my right said, are you, you're an American, I am, sort of. <laughs> Come to find out the hay barn was half full of girls. Everybody was, a man was sleeping here and a girl was sleeping here. No one thought anything of it. To make a long story short, we were at this farmhouse from the 7th of June till the 18th. Many things happened in the meantime, too numerous to, to go into detail about every one. The first thing, <coughs> first thing the SAS did upon landing was send men out, send SAS men out to blow bridges that very night. We brought a lot of explosives in with us and we immediately attacked all communications. We cut rails, railroad bridges, bridges, telephone lines. There were no railroads running, no telephone lines. All communications were cut in the our section of Brittany. <coughs> One mistake that they did was arm some of the FFI immediately and let them go out and attack the Germans that they found in cafes on the road, wherever they happened to find them. Uh, the very next day, FFI started coming back with German trucks, German motorcycles, all sorts of German equipment. What they were doing, they'd just take a gun and, and uh, walk into a restaurant, and there were seven or eight Germans sitting around there, just walk in and spray them, and, and uh, if they had a truck outside, take the truck. The truck might be filled with flour, they'd bring it back, if it was filled with with any kind of German equipment, they'd bring it back to this farmhouse. Result, we had a 
all kinds of trucks and motorcycles and all sorts of German equipment around the camp. But it was also bringing uh, uh, attention to this base that we were trying to build up. Uh, the next morning when we get up, we started looking for our radios. Our radios were dropped in baskets. We couldn't locate them. Uh, about nine o'clock in the morning, a plane came over, broad daylight, dropped out two packages, and our radio. Seems that the dispatcher forgot to throw them out that night and uh, went back to their base, discovered our radios were there, and came back in the broad daylight and threw them out. But didn't help matters any since the German garrison was two miles away. But by noon, most of the containers had been broken open, and we'd armed what FFIs that were around the house, so we did have some local security. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the answer to our call to arms by the French patriots was uh, stupendous. It was, uh, was far greater than anyone had dreamed. Between the 7th of June and the 18th of June, we had actually armed and trained 5,000 men. 5,000 men, a lot of men, to hold around one farmhouse. What we were doing was arming a battalion of about 500 men and then sending them out, sending them back to where they came from. One would be the butcher, the other would be the uh, a farmer or whatever he happened to be. We'd send him back to his farm or to his butcher shop or bakery or whatever it is, with instructions to hide his arms and to take no offensive action against the Germans until he received further orders. <coughs> From the first day that we were in there till the 18th of June, we were in contact with the enemy. That is, they kept sending out little patrols to the, to the area around this farmhouse and uh, we would kill a few of them, and perhaps they would kill a few of us, but it, there was no big attack. And the reason that there, were no, that there was no big attack, I believe, was that the Germans uh, didn't realize the force that we had there. They thought that they were, uh, had a few patriots that were arming up, and as long as a lot of patriots were uh, forming and didn't have, the, didn't have the weapons or anything, they were not too dangerous. And at that moment, it was just after D-Day, and just after D-Day, the, the Germans were so jumpy that uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't dare to pull any uh, force, such as a regiment or a division, out of line to come back and attack us. They couldn't afford it, although there were 13 German divisions in Brittany at this time. Many things happened in these last few days. We received agents from Paris, agents from London. In the meantime, we had contacted all resistance in Brittany, all resistant leaders. If the leaders and the groups of men were too far from our base, for us to arm them, we sent a message to London asking them to send a JED team to that area. And we made the necessary arrangements with that uh, resistance leader to receive this JED team. That way we could arm all of Brittany, even though it was quite a ways from our base. Well, everything went pretty well until the morning of the 18th, which was Sunday morning. That night we had received 30 planes and in these 30 planes, we received five jeeps. These five jeeps were armed with uh, twin submachine guns, twin machine guns, Browning machine guns, Vickers. <laughs> uh, about six o'clock that morning, two cars full of, uh, two cars containing uh, four felt gendarmes, which is something like our military police, came down the road towards our, our uh, farm. They were stopping every once in a while, getting out, looking around, getting back into the car and coming down. They came down to our outpost. When they got to our first outpost, they stopped. An SAS man who was in the ditch there got out of the ditch and stepped into the road with his pistol and was going to take them prisoners. One made a move to get a hand grenade, so he pulled the trigger and discovered that his pistol wasn't loaded. So before he could reload his pistol, a German threw a hand grenade at him, landed a little ways from him, but didn't kill him. <coughs> In the meantime, uh, FFI had stepped out of a ditch and shot three or four of the Germans. Well, that would have been all right, but there was another outpost about 300 yards away that ha had a machine gun in it. And when this other outpost noticed these two cars up there with the Germans standing around, they opened fire on these two cars. 
and the fire was going pretty wild. They killed a few of the Germans, but they also wounded the SAS and the FFI, who were, attempt who were right there in this road with the Germans. And result, one of the Germans got away. They killed four, wounded one, took one person, and one got away. Well, this was only a little incident because it had been happening all the time we were there. But uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, 250 felt gendarmes came back. They came into a little town by the name of Saint Marcel and took about 40 Frenchmen and marched the Frenchmen ahead of them down towards our farm. Well, we couldn't shoot at them without hitting the Frenchmen, so we just backed up and let them come in until we sucked them into a, an open field. As soon as we sucked them into this open field, we swung up a, uh, around uh, th their flank with the jeeps and uh, pretty well cut them up. They immediately started yelling rouse and get, went back and took a defensive position around this little town. Well, they never expected to meet the firepower that they met because they expected that they would meet some a uh, few partisans armed with shotguns and 22s. <coughs> well, quite a little battle took place. There was uh, woods on our right and left and wheat fields up on our left, and they shot traces into these woods and into the wheat fields and started a forest fire. Result, uh, there was so much smoke that, you, that uh, uh, our vision was limited, and we were fighting very close. That is, when you did see a German, uh, he was generally at 15 and 20 yards away, and he either got you or you got him. And uh, this went on for about uh, an hour. And then they seemed to have, they seemed to pull out. They left a few there, just, uh, it was purely, uh, they, they did a little defensive fighting, but that was all. Well, what had happened in the meantime was that when they saw our jeeps, they thought, that we were an airborne division, and they, we later found out that they had notified Rommel that we were an airborne division. So he uh, sent in some parachute troops on us. About 2 o'clock in the afternoon, parachute troops came. They were very bold, very aggressive fighters. They, uh, they fought like hell. They, uh, they didn't take advantage of cover or anything, but they were so, they were so, uh, so aggressive that uh, that they uh, soon uh, overran some of our positions, but at a great cost of their life. If, if, uh, if 10 parachutists got killed uh, coming down one lane, well, 20 would run in where 10 got killed, and if 20 got killed, well, 40 would come in. They just kept coming from everywhere. Uh, an example, uh, if you took one shot at them and 10 of them were in a wheat field, 10 of them would stand right up and just start looking for the man who took a shot, and you could pick off two or three of them. Well, everything... <coughs> things were not going so good. They they uh, had encircled our position. In the meantime, we had called out all these battalions that had been laying low, and everyone, instead of, instead of fighting on the outside of the circle, everyone came into the center of the circle, so that we were holding a radius of about 10, mile, 10 miles with uh, uh, approximately 4,000 men in there. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they had us completely surrounded and pushing us back towards the farmhouse. We, so we went back to the headquarters, back to the farmhouse, and sent an SOS to London for planes. Within two hours and a half, we had about 35 fighter bombers over us. They did a pretty good job of bombing transportation, German transportation that was coming up. But as far as bombing the troops, it was pretty difficult to see what was going on on the ground. And they bombed hell out of us. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it helped our morale, helped the morale of the Patriots because they knew that uh, they hadn't forgot us in London. Now, everyone that was inside of this circle, after we were once surrounded, uh, I'm sure that he didn't think he was going to get out of there alive. He was fighting till death. Therefore, if the parachutist did move in, they moved in over FFI dead bodies because they never budged an inch. Well, late by 8 o'clock at night, they had driven into about 800 yards from the farmhouse, and they were on a hill dominating the farmhouse. It's pretty hard to describe the scene at the farmhouse about this time because all the, uh, practically every SAS officer was either killed or wounded. And we only had a very, very small first aid station. And the first aid station couldn't take care of one-tenth of the wounded. Everyone was laying around the yard, uh, around this barnyard, either dying dead or, or bleeding. And some of them were screaming. Some of them were, were not saying anything. Uh, it was just terrific. The confusion was absolutely terrible. Uh, there was only one thing to do when they had us at that farmhouse when they were so close was to launch a counterattack. So we got the two, two remaining jeeps. We had two jeeps left, farmhouse. And I remember 
A French officer. I can't think of his name offhand, but one of the best officers I've ever seen in my life. He'd been shot through the shoulder and shot in the head. He tied himself into a jeep so he wouldn't fall out. With another SAS that would that uh, that uh, drove the jeep, he launched. He started off in the counterattack. Captain Arad, who is my French partner, took one group of men, numbering about four or five hundred, and I took a group of men, numbering about four or five hundred, and launched this counterattack. Well, we drove them back about a thousand yards. We drove them down on the other side of the hill. It was a bloody massacre. We must have lost about six or seven hundred men in about an hour. And we had drove them back a little too far because uh, the Germans that were on our right drove, uh, drove in on our, our right flank behind us. So we, as a result, we had to fight our way back. When we get back, when I got back to the farmhouse, it was pretty hard to control the men because uh, there was so much confusion and, and so many hedges you couldn't tell, you couldn't see exactly where your men were on the other, on, in the next field. When I got back to the farmhouse, I tried to locate Captain Erad, and I couldn't find him anywhere. And it was getting dusk. It was about nine, half past nine, ten o'clock. And the Germans had taking, taken a, a little barn, a little shed, about uh, 300 yards away from the farmhouse where the uh, SAS radio equipment was. So uh, the SAS wanted to go up, go down and get their radio equipment. So I went down, went down there with a group of uh, FFI and an uh, SAS lieutenant that hadn't been killed. The SA, SAS lieutenant and myself were the only ones to come back alive. Most of us got, most of them got killed when we walked up to the edge of a hedge that was overlooking a wheat field and uh, we were trying to distinguish Germans from F, uh, FFI uh, on the other side of this field. And uh, We'd been there for about five minutes when a machine gun opened up about ten yards in front of us. This German machine gun had been there all the time and hadn't fired, and we, all, all the FFI were in one group, and they, most of them got it in that one group, and we were not able to take this shed where their radio equipment was. So we, we went back for help and brought some more FFI down and, and kept a, quite a, a large no-man's land there. Uh, between one field and another. They were on the other side of the field, we were on this side of the field, and there was no cover that they could advance, so we just held them there. Uh, Commandant Bourguin, who was this French officer commanding SAS, was, was in a pretty tight situation. He had not been wounded. He decided that the only thing to do would be break through after dark. So we issued orders that as soon as darkness fell, we were to split up in small groups and try to break through the encirclement as best we could. It was more or less every man for himself. And those that did get through were to stay in small groups, no, big, no larger than two or three, and were to take no offensive action against the Germans until further orders. Well, uh, oh yes, we also made a rendezvous for the next day. All the leaders were supposed to meet at a certain spot the next day. And out of those, there were five leaders, five or six leaders, that knew where this rendezvous was. And they were to bring no more than three or four of their immediate uh, subordinates so that everyone wouldn't know where this rendezvous was. Therefore, we wouldn't have a whole flock of uh, FFI coming to one spot and, and uh, attracting a lot of attention. Well, I finally located uh, Captain Irad in a radio operator. And we were supposed to leave in a car, so we went, back, went out back to get into the car I, I can never, I can't emphasize enough the situation at this, at this point. Everybody was, we, we had hundreds and hundreds of wounded, and everyone was around the farmhouse, everybody, everyone was, uh, was asking to be carried out, and if a man was shot through a leg or through the, through the guts or anything, you, you just couldn't do anything for him. You just left him there, and you, you, if he looked at you, you just looked away and just didn't say anything. Some of them never said a word. I have to come back. I forgot something. Uh, we had armed 5,000 men, but we had also received a store of arms for another 5,000 that hadn't been distributed. And we also had about five tons of high explosives. And that was the reason why we were holding the farmhouse, because it would have been foolish to fight this type of warfare with untrained men against a trained enemy uh, had, uh, had we had not some objective in view. Well, when, when we saw it was impossible to, to hold, we decided to blow up the arms of 5,000 men with the high explosive we had. 
So that was one of the things we were going to do as soon as we leave, as soon as we left. Uh, one of the things that I remember quite clearly was when we decided to blow up the arms, there were quite a few SAS men laying around wounded. And they didn't want to blow it up by a time pencil, that is, they didn't want to put a time fuse on it and let it blow up when the time fuse expired. They didn't want to do that because they figured if the Germans get up there and cut the fuse, the, uh, the, ex the explosive wouldn't go off and they'd have the arms. So uh, about five or six of the wounded men laying around the floors and on the tables and one thing or another were arguing with one another to see who would blow it up. Uh, naturally, it was certain death, uh, but they didn't do it uh, with any... Uh, so they were trying to be brave or anything. They just sensibly argued to see who would who would blow it up. I remember one man saying, well, now, don't be foolish. Why should you blow it up? You're only shot through both legs, and I'm shot in the chest and the arms, and just carry me up there, and I'll blow it up myself. Well, anyway, we went out to get in this car that was going to take us out. And when we got to the car, there were about 50 people trying to get into the car. And they were going to shoot it out to see who got in the car, because everyone was looking out for his own hide then. And it was a survival of the fittest. So we decided to let them go rather than get into any trouble. So we took off by ourselves. We plotted our asthmas to this rendezvous that we were supposed to go to and started out. As we started out, five British pilots who we had previously picked up that had been shot down wanted to go with us because they were lost. No one was paying any attention to them. So we told them they could come with us. So we started out. We met a, we joined a company that was going to make a breakthrough as, a, as one body, as a company. We broke through all right. They lost quite a few men. No one on our party was killed. As soon as we got on the out outside of what we considered the outside of the ring, we left them and went on by ourselves. It was dark by this time, about 11 o'clock. Didn't get dark until about 11 o'clock because it was in the middle of the summer. Uh, we had a lot of trouble with the British pilots. They were good boys, but they had these British hobnail shoes on. They were making an awful lot of racket at night, and they, they knew nothing about infantry tactics, and uh, they were absolutely terrible. We walked for about uh, about two hours and sat down beside a little field for a little rest. We didn't know it, but we'd sat down right beside a road. And about five minutes after we sat down there, a German column of paratroopers started marching up this road, and we laid, uh, we were about 20 yards away from this road. But it took them about 15 minutes to walk by. Sort of a ticklish situation. Uh, if I can give you an idea of what was going on. It wasn't just this easy. You see, everyone had been trying to break through, and everyone had, had, had broken through in, in small groups, broken through this encirclement. Therefore, we had uh, small groups uh, wandering around everywhere and uh, trying to get away. And one small group would run into another. That is, if, if an FFI group ran into another FFI group, well, they would just stop firing at one another, not knowing that they were FFI, because there were German patrols trying to pick up the FFI group that had broke, break in, broken through. And uh, result, everyone was firing at everything that moved. They were killing horses and cattle and everything else. Two o'clock in the morning, there was a terrific explosion. We were approximately 10 miles away, nearly knocked us to the ground. It was terrific. Turned night into day. I think it, it I, can't, I can't quite describe the explosion, but it was terrific. Our ammunition started going off. and went off all night, way into the next day. This, uh, this explosion uh, certainly confused the Germans. By this time, they had brought up a little artillery, and they started uh, firing artillery out into the dark anywhere it might land. Uh, they, they couldn't understand, it's my, my idea, that they couldn't understand uh, what this explosion was. Well, we kept on until about 5 o'clock in the morning. 5 o'clock in the morning, we decided to lay down and get a little rest. Uh, there were just a very few hedges around, no cover, so we decided to lay low in a wheat field. We went into a wheat field from different angles so that we wouldn't leave any one path giving our position away. We had laid in this wheat field, we laid in a semicircle. I think we'd laid there until about six o'clock in the morning when we were awakened by Cossacks, Russian Cossacks, coming by on horseback. It was a pretty good thing that they uh, woke us up, I guess, because we looked around and and discovered that we were within sight of a German radio station. So it didn't take us very long to get out of there. We got out of there and continued our journey towards our rendezvous. We uh, arrived at our rendezvous. We arrived at our rendezvous, I think, about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Everyone was there. 
Uh, one thing I've got to say at this point. There was uh, an organization named the BOA uh, sent in by London. And this uh, organization uh, was to find, uh, uh, their main job was to find um, landing grounds and make reception committees. And this one man, whose name was Tangebury, had on paper all the landing grounds that we were to use in Brittany. And later, he was captured by the Gestapo. Therefore, every time we attempted to use one of these grounds, we always had a reception committee of either felt gendarme or Gestapo. Well, after holding a council of war that day, we decided to break up. That is, Commandant Bourguin, with his SAS, were to go underground. He, would, he was to get into civilian clothes and lay low and let the heat cool off, because at, at this, uh, this was just the next day and everything was boiling around there. White, uh, white Russians, they were Georgian, Georgian Russians, w would come into a house, and if there were three men in that house, other than one, where there was one before, they just killed everybody, men, women, and children. They, they, were, they, were, they were rotten, they were, were terrible, they were even worse than the Germans. They committed all sorts of atrocities. And uh, that day, that day that we were there, they were riding down through town, shooting men, women, and children. They just ride down through, t they just ride down through a town on horseback and just fire into the houses and one thing or another. Well, it was impossible to keep the patriots from firing back. We had told them to lay low and not take any offensive action against the Germans, but their action was more or less defensive because if a German came into the house to kill his wife, well, naturally the man would, would fight. And so everyone was fighting for a radius of about 40 or 50 miles around there. Uh, something else I've got to tell you now that I forgot. Previously, uh, we were attacked on Sunday. Saturday, we had made plans to go to the Loire Inferior, which was the next department. That is, Jedburg George had our team, uh, myself, uh, Captain Erod, and our radio operator. We're going to go to the Loire Inferior to try and organize the resistance in the Loire Inferior and arm them. We had armed 5,000 men and had another 5,000 organized, ready to arm, so we considered our work done in the, this department of the Mudbian. We also had two Gestapo agents working for us. We were paying them a high price, and we were also, we also uh, promised them that when the Americans got to us, that we'd see that they got a fair deal, that they would uh, be turned over to us and work with us. So that uh, we had previously gone to the department of the Loire Inferior with these two Gestapo agents in their car. We'd sit in the back seat and they'd sit in the front and every time that we were stopped by a German patrol, they would just show their identification and everything was all right. But Sunday we had been attacked, so Monday we couldn't very well go with them. Everything had, was shot up in the air. So we decided to go to the Loire Inferior and leave Bourguin in the Morbihan. We were to keep contact with Commandant Bourguin through London. That is, we were, sent, we were to send a message to London in London would uh, relay our message back to Bourguin since we didn't have uh, communications direct to him. Well, he left, and that left us, Jed George, with two agents known as Otar and Funksho. We hadn't slept, we hadn't eaten for three or four days, about three days, I think it was, so we decided to eat supper there at the Chateau de Cadac. We were at a big chateau. There was a count and a countess at the chateau, the Count de Lanma and the Countess de Lanma. We sat down for supper that night, and the parachutist came in and said we'll have to, you'd have to leave immediately if, if there was a possibility of leaving because we were surrounded, the Germans knew we were there and they were coming in to take us. Uh, this old lady, who was about 45 years old, uh, said that she would get us out of there. So she took us, she took us down through this garden and through a hole in the wall. It was a big, a very big uh, wall surrounding the castle, and the Germans hadn't got inside of this wall. It was very dark, it was raining very hard, it had been raining all day. Uh, she took us by the hand down through the woods to a river. It was so dark that she actually, actually had to lead us by the hand. When we got to the river, she told us to swim the river and to travel north, follow the river north. And she also told us that sometime during the night that she would whistle, she gave the prearranged whistle, and that she would take us to a safe hiding place. So we swam across the river and uh, decided that she was a very nice old lady, but a little nuts, because no one was going to find us in the middle of the night, in the raining and everything like that. So we started north, and she returned to the chateau to clear up any evidence that we'd left around there, such as English cigarette butts or uh, coffee cans or anything that might uh, uh, cause them to get in trouble with the Germans. Well, 
As strange as it may seem, four o'clock in the morning, we heard the old lady whistling on the other side of the river. She, we answered her whistle, and she jumped into that river and swam across. We nearly got drowned swimming across the river. The river was swollen. She got across just like nobody's business, and then took us to a, to a, a mill, an old mill, where we slept for about an hour and a half. This time we were living on benzene tablets, a uh, tablet that will give you a lot of false strength as long as you live on them, as long as you keep taking them every six hours. But the minute that you, you relax and you don't take them, well, then you just, you, you just can't go any further. So we took some more of these tablets and struck off the next morning for a farmhouse, which was supposed to be a safe house. Well, we got out to this safe house after having a couple of narrow scrapes with, with um, with these uh, Russian Cossacks. Because these Russian Cossacks were re really raising hell. They were doing everything. They were com committing all sorts of atrocities. They took one five-year-old boy. They came into this house, and uh, parents went to home, but there was a five-year-old boy to home, so they took him and nailed him to a door when he was alive, and then bayoneted him through the belly. It took quite a while for him to die. They were doing such things as that. They caught one of our girls. We were using a lot of girls as liaison agents. They could get through where a man couldn't get through. And uh, they caught this girl, her name was Mary. She was a very nice looking girl, dark hair, and she'd come from Paris. She'd bicycled in from Paris. I think it was something like 300, 300 or 400 kilometers. And she bicycled from Paris to where, uh, to our headquarters to bring us a message. And they caught her and tied a rope underneath her armpits, then tied the rope around the, the saddle horn of the saddle and dragged it down the road until she was dead. Well, they were doing things like that. But anyway, we got out to this farmhouse and laid low there. Uh, we picked up quite a few parachutists and, and other wound, wounded that had got through, and we, had, we were keeping them in this house. Well, we had no, no first aid facilities or anything like that, so gangrene was setting in, and broken bones, men had attempted to, to walk with broken legs, and the bones were overlapping. So we finally made contact with a doctor who, who, who uh, was willing to come out and take care of them. Well, we nearly got caught in this farmhouse by felt gendarmes, so we decided to move out away from the farmhouse. So we found, a, with the help of the farmer, we found a, an old oven that a charcoal maker used to use. It was, a, it was a hole in the ground. It was very, very dark in this hole in the ground. You couldn't see a thing. And we literally lived in the ground for five days, five days and five nights. It was, uh, it was pretty rugged. It doesn't seem like much, but 24 hours a day is a, is a long time to just sit in the dark and, and uh, not say much because there's, you can talk for the first 24 hours, but then you can't think of anything to talk about and you start getting grouchy at one another. Jean-Pierre, who was our liaison agent, had been sent ahead, and he uh, had made arrangements for us to stay at the Chateau de la Gaire. Uh, we we uh, then went into this Chateau de la Gaire and slept in the library. The Count uh, sneaked us in, and uh, it was the first time we'd been in a bed for uh, for about a month. Once we got in there, we felt pretty good and uh, started talking out loud, and he told us it would be a good idea for us to be quiet because uh, he had some Luftwaffe officers sleeping in the other end of the chateau floor. It was a kind of an uncomfortable feeling to begin with, but uh, we got used to it. In, in between us and the Luftwaffe officers were a lot of uh, orphans. Uh, one, uh, the Americans had uh, accidentally bombed uh, an orphanage, and uh, they had uh, evacuated the children that were not casualties, and they were staying there in this chateau. Up until now, we had been uh, living in uh, military clothes, but at this point, the uh, Count uh, got us some civilian clothes, and we started going in civilian clothes. Well, we finally contacted this uh, underground leader in Alsony, and um, this is what we had decided to do. We we're going to act as day mayors of the Loire Inferior. Day mayor means uh, military chiefs of that department. While Fonction was going to be day mayor of Ille-Vilaine, which was a, a department to the north, and Otair, who was the other agent, was going to be uh, a day mayor of the Morbihan, so that we can control the three departments. They gave us the Loire Inferior because I think they were afraid to take it themselves. It was a very tough uh, department, and no one had been in there to organize it, while ille Vilaine and Morbihan had been organized. It was a very, very difficult to or to, uh, job to organize the Loire Inferior, 
and all the credit goes to the French officer that was with me. He uh, did a splendid job. Uh, all the underground in the Loire and Ferriere was more or less run by the Gestapo. That is, the Gestapo agents were actually chiefs of the underground. Uh, a Gestapo agent in civilian clothes who speaks fluent French is just like any Frenchman. And if he's, and at that time, uh, Frenchmen were coming in from everywhere and no one was asking questions because everyone was escaping this forced labor in Germany. So a man could come in and if he was intelligent and smart, he could sell somebody the idea that he was, uh, hated the Germans and one thing or another and could easily work himself up to get a group uh, to work for him and he would be uh, uh, an underground man working uh, against the Germans in the resistance. And another thing we ran, against, ran up against was uh, several different groups, several different organizations, underground organizations uh, were active in the Loire and Ferriere. Uh, and while they were not busy fighting the Germans, they were busy fighting uh, amongst themselves. That is, if Joe here had 100 men under him and Jack had uh, 150, well, Jack would be fighting Joe to get his men away, and one might be a communist while the other was just an FFI and there was, everyone was fighting everyone else. So it was quite a job to take and, and weld these uh, different groups into one. The actual men that were enlisted into these groups were very good men. It was the leaders that were causing all the trouble. So it was, um, it was necessary to take care of the leaders. A few of the leaders came up missing, and to make a long story short, uh, everything was welded into one. And uh, Captain Arad, by some miracle, uh, did it without getting caught, because uh, we'd have meetings of 12 leaders one day, and the next day there'd be three left, because there was a Gestapo agent at the meeting, and. Uh, he had all these men that were at the meeting picked up. We were not living in one place any length of time. We'd stay in one house maybe one day, and then we'd move into a hotel the next day, and, and one day we'd be living as, <coughs> as students, and perhaps the next day as, as old farmers and old uh, dirty overalls with wooden shoes, and, and then the next day we'd uh, be living in a doctor's house or something like that, so that we never stayed in one place, and we never let anyone know where we were staying. The three of us stayed together all the time, <coughs> And when we had made contact with anyone, it was through a liaison agent at a certain rendezvous. We, uh, n the liaison, liaison agent didn't know where we were staying. We didn't want him to know, and he didn't want to know. Uh, in the event that he would get caught, he wouldn't be able to tell where we were. Well, to make a long story short, we organized Loire and Ferriere. We had about 5,000 men organized. Well, up until this time, we hadn't made contact with London. That is, we hadn't made contact with London since we had been shot up at Safri. And this organization took about three weeks. And since we hadn't come on the air for three weeks, some joker in, in London uh, thought that we were controlled by the Gestapo. He thought the Gestapo had caught us and they were forcing us to, to uh, send messages just the same. I don't know why he ever thought that because in the event that we're captured by the Gestapo, we have a certain number that we change in our code uh, that signifies that we're being forced to work and the all information that's coming through is false. Well, we hadn't changed that, and our cipher chief in London kept insisting with the Becerra, which was a French, the French organization that was handling us, and he kept insisting that we were not controlled by the Gestapo, but nevertheless, they didn't work with us. Well, we used to send four messages a day and some at night begging them, pleading with them to send us any kind of equipment, because at that time, Patton's army, the Third Army, was coming down into Brittany, and the Germans were escaping up the Loire, and we had no arms or anything to stop them with. Well, we had uh, reception committees out on different grounds, night and day, for about two weeks. And uh, after two weeks, well, they, they just had lost faith in us. Uh, it was all right for the first few days, but then we started losing a lot of men on these grounds, you, you take a, a group of Frenchmen and put them out on the ground for a reception committee, and uh, it'll be all right for the first two days, but they talk a little too much. And the first thing you know, everyone knows about it, and the first thing you know, uh, some uh, Gestapo man knows about it, and they're all picked up, shot, or something else. So, when, when London just wouldn't play with us, we lost all hope in it. One thing that, we, that London was interested in, and the only thing London was interested in, we had a man who was working for us, a Frenchman, was an engineer working for the Todd organization. And he was working in a G2, in a German G2 office. And he was uh, uh, reproducing plans. 
And uh, every plan that came into this G2 office, he would make a duplicate copy and, and uh, give us a duplicate copy so that we had the, a copy of all the coastal defenses along the Loire and Ferriara and uh, a copy of the plans of uh, U-boat uh, pens at saint Nazaire. And we notified London that we had these plans and, uh, and they became interested in them. And we're going to send a, a Lysander in after them. So we said, well, that's good. If the Lysander comes in, well, if we have to throw the pilot out, we'll go back to London ourselves and, and straighten this out because uh, they sent us here to do a job and w once we get the thing ready, they won't send us any arms. Well, they didn't send the Lysander in. They couldn't send it in. And when they couldn't send it in, we couldn't get the plans and nothing worked out. Well, it, it came to the point where we had to uh, take the situation into our own hands and not wait for London, because the Germans by this time were really leaving the, the uh, Brittany Peninsula. So we gave the orders to all these men to, to strike the enemy in any possible mean, by any possible means they could. We uh, got a lot of saws and axes and chopped trees across the roads and did everything we could to hinder, hinder their, uh, their escape up the Loire. We blew up bridge with bridges with gun cottons and for fuses we used to use cigarette lighters and things like that. It was just, uh, it wasn't very good. And uh, we, we armed a few men um, by actually taking the, the weapons away from the Germans. Say that two Germans were at a bar or in some, uh, in, in, in some pub, well, uh, ten Frenchmen would go in and knock them over the head with a bottle and take two guns, and with two guns they'd shoot four Germans and get four guns, and with six guns they'd get ten, and that way they, they armed themselves, but it was very inadequate. Uh, <coughs> about this time, Patton was driving down into the Brittany Peninsula, and we decided these plans were, were quite important, so we were going to, and since London couldn't send in a Lysander, we were going to try to get the plans through to, to the Third Army. We we're going to try to infiltrate through, if we could. Well, it was, uh, Saturday we were eating dinner, and this uh, woman came up, this liaison agent, and said that the uh, Americans had made a terrific advance and were at Chateaubriand, which is about 100 kilometers away. So we decided to try to get the plans through if we could. Uh, colonel Vaudel, who was the colonel of the Loire and Ferriard, it, it, all the underground in the Loire and Ferriard had centralized under one command, and Colonel Vaudel, or Colonel Felix, was the commanding officer. So he and myself, in civilian clothes on bicycles, were to go down the road uh, along the River Loire uh, to contact any Americans that might be coming up the river. While uh, the French officer, uh, Captain Irad, and the radio operator were to come down a back road with the plans in civilian clothes. So uh, everything went all right. We came into a little town uh, of Varad, that is the Colonel and I, and uh, from there we held a little council of war. And we swapped addresses, that is, the pilots and, and myself, and uh, talked it over and said, if anyone does get through this alive, well, they could tell the story. Uh, we all, I also told the pilots at this point that they should go off by themselves, that is, they should break into groups of two and three and try to get through for themselves, and not to stick with us because the Gestapo knew who we were, had pictures, had all the information they wanted on us, and if they were caught with us, well, they'd get the same works that we were going to get. While if they were caught by themselves and told the told a true story, they might get away as prisoners of war, since they were pilots shot down. Well, two of the Americans and one of the British were willing to do that, and they took off immediately. And they were gone for about 50 yards, and the three of them were killed. They ran right into a machine gun. So that scared the other two, and the other two wanted to stick with us. So they stayed with us, and we struck off in another direction. Well, we ran into another machine gun, and everybody immediately changed directions. And uh, I remember my glasses caught on a twig and were pulled off. So I went back to get them. And uh, by this time, everyone was out of breath and, and no one, uh, I wasn't caring so much. I figured, well, if I get killed here, I won't get killed some other place. And the guy was shooting over my head all the time. Uh, so I, I threw a grenade at him and he stopped firing and picked up my glasses and looked around. And by this time, everybody had left me. They'd all got ahead of me. So I, uh, I ran to catch up with them and I, I uh, soon found that my, uh, that my French captain was waiting for me. So uh, he said, well, we're, not, we're getting nowhere fast. Just we've been running in circles here. We just can't break through this thing, so we might as well lay low. So the radio operator came back and one agent and this uh, British and American pilot. And at this point, I told, the American, I told these two pilots to leave us immediately, and they, they didn't say anything. So I pulled a gun on them and told them either leave or I'd shoot them. 
And uh, the, the, the American pilot fell on the ground and just, just couldn't go. He was scared like a rabbit, just like a dog when you beat a dog, he puts his tail between his legs and get down. He just couldn't move, so there wasn't anything we could do was just leave him with us. And if he was caught, well, he'd have to suffer the consequences. So we, got into, we crawled into some bushes there, bushes about four or five feet high and, and laid low. Well, all this had happened in, uh, in the space of a half an hour, so it was now about uh, 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Well, here's what happened. 300 men were hid in these, in these little woods, and the Germans would climb up trees, and uh, one German would spot uh, some people hiding in some bushes over there and would yell and point over to the, to the uh, people hiding in the bushes, and uh, three or four Germans would, would walk down to these bushes and throw in a hand grenade, and three or four uh, Frenchmen would come running out, and they'd just shoot them. They didn't have any arms, and it was just like shooting quail. That went on all day. About 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, they, uh, they found this little girl in the cellar and bayoneted her, and she screamed for about five or ten minutes before she died. It was, it was terrible. It was something we never forget. It was, it, was, it, was, it was terrific. And shooting was going on and killing going on in these woods all day long. Yeah, it, was a, it was the worst day of our life, no doubt about it. It couldn't be any worse. See, it, was, it would be different if we were out there fighting, if we could, she could fight, but it, it was, it, we were hiding, we were, we were cornered like rats. It was different than uh, we wanted to get out there and fight and either get killed, get it over with, or, or, uh, or get out. I remember we reviewed, uh, I remember personally taking out my pocketbook and going over what pictures I had and thinking my whole life through from the day I was born. Then the afternoon, something that, that, that I remember quite clearly, in the afternoon, about 4 o'clock, everyone got to laughing hysterically. I don't know if we were laughing or crying, but uh, we couldn't stop laughing. And at times, the German was, were walking 20 paces away from us, so it was, it, was, uh, it was quite dangerous to laugh like that, but we just couldn't help it. Uh, I can't remember everything that happened that day. We we just stayed there all the time, and and uh, it was just terrible. Uh, I think a French captain kept us together. We wanted to get out. Most of us wanted to get out there and either and either get it over with or or get through. And he said, no, the best thing to do would be just wait, and if they did discover us there, that uh, we'd fight it out then. And if they didn't discover us there, well, we stood a better chance of getting out. So about uh, 11 o'clock at night, I contacted this pilot who was just a few ways, a few yards away from us. You see, it was, it was very, uh, the situation was, it was terrible. We were laying maybe three or four paces from one another, and, uh, and we couldn't move a, a bush, we couldn't move a muscle. If you fell into one position in the morning, you had to be in that same position at 11 o'clock at night. We didn't dare to move because the Germans were, were so close to us. They, they also had dogs on our trails at the beginning of the morning, and it, that, was, that was terrible. It was a terrible sensation to hear these, these dogs on our trail uh, howling as they were and uh, thinking that maybe they'd come and get you. It would have been a hell of a lot. It would, we wanted to get out and fight and get it over with, but um, the dogs couldn't follow us because everybody had been running in every direction, and it was impossible for them to follow our trail. Anyway, 11 o'clock at night, I went over and spoke to this American pilot and told him to stay there and that we were going to go out in a certain direction. And if he didn't hear any firing, to come out in that same direction about an hour later. I gave him uh, some francs. I had quite a few francs. I gave him francs so if he did get through. And I told him uh, that if he, if he ever got through, to write to my wife. and gave him my address. And um, then we took off. Well, everything went pretty well. Miracle after miracle happened. We passed sentries about 25 paces away. And... Uh, I can remember when we had our training in school, we used to go through a lot of crazy schemes and everybody bitched like hell. But I thank God that night that we'd had that training because it certainly saved our lives. We, uh, we, it progressed quite a ways until we came by a farmhouse and a dog started barking. Someone started shooting. Someone fired at us in the general direction. Uh, and then everyone started shooting. The whole woods where we had been, all the Germans started firing. Everybody started firing. It was, I don't know what they were firing at, but certainly, Certainly they were not firing at, at anyone. They were just firing because everybody was so uh, on edge. So we, we ran across in one field and then got down by a road. And it was a German sentry on this road. And we waited until he would walk down, turn around and walk back. And as he would walk back, one of us would skip across the road. And um, that way we got on the other side of this road without any one of us getting killed. And once we were on the other side of the road, we, we uh, then figured that we were out of out of the encirclement. We figured that we were in the clear. 
And so we felt pretty good. It was a, quite a relaxation after that day. And, uh, but we, we'd gone just a little ways when we heard a German patrol cutting us off. They'd, they'd come over two or three hedges and they were coming across another field. We couldn't, we couldn't see how they possibly knew we were there and still we figured, well, they must have, they must have seen us because here they come. And at this point, we were through running. Even though we were in the open, we decided we won't run another inch. We'll, we'll fight it out to the finish right here. I remember there was a very thick hedge and we were waiting for them on the other side of this hedge. We couldn't see them. We could hear them running up. They ran up the other side of the hedge and we pulled the pins on grenades. We were going to throw the grenades over the other side of the hedge and then lay flat. After they went off, we were going to spread, we were going to uh, spray the bushes, spray this hedge and then get, get out. Well, they came up on the other side of the hedge and, uh, and stopped and uh, one, of, one of them said in French, mettez-vous en ligne, which means get in a, in a, in a single file a single line. So then we knew there were Frenchmen, but uh, we still had to be very careful because even though there were Frenchmen, they would shoot at us if we made a noise because they were taking no chances. The same story was repeating itself. Every, every group that was getting through, those that were armed were shooting at one another and, and uh, it was a hell of a lot of confusion. So we said to them in French, uh, we're French, we don't know who you are, but send a man down to the gate at the other end of this hedge. See, there was a hedge and a gate down to the other end send a man down there and, uh, and we'll see who you are and so on. So they sent a man down there and it was absolutely a miracle. Uh, the person on the other side of this hedge was the other agent and he had the other half of our radio. And uh, here it was three miles away from, uh, from the farmhouse and, uh, and uh, we met this agent. He could have gone in any other direction of the compass. So then we were all together once more, had the radio together. And uh, with him was this, um, the leader of this uh, Mackie, Yako. So we sent him out, sent him away, so that only six of us stayed together. That is a uh, Jedberg George, two agents and one liaison agent. And we told Yako that uh, we would contact him later and in the meantime to just lay low. And so we took off by ourselves and walked about uh, five miles that night and then uh, crawled in some bushes and went to sleep. We stayed there for two days. Uh, after that, we tried to contact Colonel Kingley who was uh, given to us by London as a uh, chief of resistance in the Loire Inferior. And he didn't want to see us. He was afraid. He, uh, he was no good. He, uh, he was afraid to do anything. He hadn't done anything for the resistance. The only, he was a politician of the first degree and he just, uh, just, just never did a thing. Well, we were still quite a ways from from organizing anything in the water and Ferriard because everything that we had started had been shot up in the air. So we decided to go from there to Varad, which was, on the, which was a little town right on the river because we had an address there uh, in Varad and we figured that we could make contact with some, uh, some resistance group in Varad. First 24 hours in the hole wasn't too bad. But five days was too much. We started getting pretty grouchy and started backing on one another. So we decided to come out of the hole. Came out of the hole one afternoon and went down to the farmhouse. We hadn't shaved for five days. So we got a little water out of the well, started to shave. We were half, halfway through the process when two men came from the town. They, come running, they came running in and uh, said that the doctor had sent them. Said that the Gestapo knew where we were. The Gestapo and Feldgendam knew where we were and that they were going to attack us late that afternoon. Didn't take much time, we got out of there. And uh, this farmer took us down to his brother-in-law. We had been traveling north from the place that we had been attacked. And what we wanted to do was go into the, the department of the Loire Inferior, which was south. So we had to make a sort of a detour uh, to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, so we took off and went down to his, to his uh, brother-in-law's. And from his brother-in-law's, we March for another two hours. Then it got dark. Then it got, uh, then it, um, then the dawn came. <laughs> um, we could only march for about four or five hours because the nights were very short. It was in the middle of the summer. We laid low there. Incidentally, this, uh, the Gestapo did come out to the house. They killed his, his wife and his children. They shot the doctor. And uh, he returned and they, they killed him. And uh, at this Chateau de Calac, where we were to begin with, 
where this, uh, we were staying with the Count and the Countess. The next day, they shot the Count, but they didn't shoot the Countess. They had found uh, some evidence that, the, that we had been around there and, and shot the Count for it. Well, this went on. We'd go from one place to another, walking about four or five hours every night. We were getting nowhere fast because we had about 150 miles to go. Every time we crossed the railroad track on our trip at night, we'd either tear up a rail or rip up what communications we came across. After we'd been walking for about three days, we decided to go into a town and get something to eat. We, we'd walk through towns every night. It was just going at night was all right, but we were not getting anywhere, and, uh, and we were running great risks. Every night we'd, we'd have to, we were walking right straight through the center of town. The Germans would be on the sidewalk and we'd walk through the towns with a carbine on our back. Many times we were caught, uh, caught in, the, in the outskirts of a town by Germans and we just never said a word and just walked right straight through and they never said a word. Well, if we had, had made a run for it or, or jumped over our head to something, they'd have said something. It, uh, uh, the, the bolder you were, the more you'd get away with. If you just didn't give a damn and just went on and... Uh, and let things take care of themselves, they seemed to get by okay. Well, when we went into this town in the daytime, in civilian clothes, we, by some miracle, met a liaison agent that we'd been working with that we had sent to the Wild and Ferry Island, and he was coming back. So once that we were in contact with this liaison agent, we sent him ahead to the Wild and Ferry Island to bring back a truck. So we were going to try to run this gauntlet in the truck. This was just a little while after D-Day, and all roads were being watched pretty hard to circulate unless you had permission from the Germans. So he brought back a little covered truck, and this man had permission from the Germans to circulate. He was collecting milk for the Germans. It was a little covered truck, and he had three pigs in the, in the back of the truck. So five of us get into the back of the truck uh, with submachine guns, and we put the pigs in, in the corner by the driver's seat and lift up the, a little of the flap, exposing the pigs, and started our trip to the water and We were stopped five times by the Germans. We stopped at every bridge we came to, and uh, they just checked the papers, looked into the back, saw the pigs, and let us go. Well, we came into this Mackey called the Mackey of Safri. It was the Mackey, or the group of men that we had organized previously. Remember I said we had gone down there with the, the Gestapo, with these two Gestapo agents that were working for us, and we had given orders to this leader to organize only 50 men and hold them at this farmhouse, and we were going to use those, these 50 men as uh, uh, reception, for a reception committee only. We didn't want to repeat the same thing that had happened in the mud beyond. We didn't want to, uh, to have a great uh, uh, collection of men and no arms, or a great collection of men at one point. Well, when we got into this Mackey, we came in about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we found about 300 men there, with arms for about 20 men, and everyone was coming and going at will, and uh, the, the situation was uh, literally screwed up. So the first thing we did was reorganize their defenses with arms for 20 men, and uh, decided that the next thing, uh, th decided the next morning the very first thing we'd do would be uh, uh, split these men up, send them out in groups of 5, 10, 15, all throughout the country, keep them under our control, but not uh, centralized at any one point. And then we had supper that night with the leaders of this camp, and uh, the man who sat across me, across from me was a, uh, claimed to be one of the leaders of the underground, was a Gestapo agent. We didn't know it at the time, and he left camp that night. We still didn't know, didn't know it that night that he had left camp. Well, as a result, the next thing we knew it was 6 o'clock in the morning. We'd been sleeping in the middle of a wheat field, and this Yako, who was uh, uh, chief of, the, of that little monkey, came out, woke us up, and said, I think we've had it. He said, the... Uh, we're completely surrounded. Uh, every road is, is cut off, and uh, they're moving in from every direction. And we woke up, and they were moving in. We could hear trucks coming in from every direction. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. We didn't have time to do anything. This all took place in a fraction of a second. We woke up, and the sky was filled with, with very lights. The Germans had fired up very lights in every direction. Uh, a radio operator at this time was receiving a message from London. So the only the first thought in our mind was, let everything go and just get hold of the radio. So we ran down, picked up the radio, and the minute that these very lights went off, hell started breaking loose. That is, they were about 200 yards away, and they just started firing machine guns at this farmhouse and 
there were 300 men at this, in and around this farmhouse, and as a result, everybody started running in, uh, in opposite directions, and they were, they were just uh, getting nowhere fast, and men were, were dropping like flies. Uh, we uh, made a desperate attempt to organize them and get them started out in three different groups, and we did. Uh, at this farmhouse, there was a farmer and his wife and a daughter, an eight-year-old daughter, so we stuck the daughter down in, a, in, in the cellar, and the, far and the farmer's wife was with us. Uh, I forgot to say that there were, we found three Americans and two British pilots at this farmhouse. They'd been shot down over France, and, and the uh, underground had picked them up and brought them to this Mackey. And they stuck with us. In our group, there were about 40. Uh, just before we left, there was a, a Bren gun, a man who was commanding a Bren gun who, who'd get killed. So I picked up the Bren gun and, and uh, went over to a head where German trucks pulled up about 15 feet away, the three trucks. We had about three or four magazines for this Bren gun. And I just, I held the, threw the gun up onto a hedge. Captain Arad stuck in the clips and we fired the three clips into these trucks. Made the Germans yell a little bit. And we threw the gun away because uh, we didn't have any use for the gun because we didn't have any shells for it. And um, then the 40 of us ran down this hedge. We ran down the hedge for about 100 yards. And then we met an FFI who, was, who came back and said it was impossible to go out that way. The Germans were coming up. He had a Sten gun and three clips of ammunition, so we told him to go back and fire three clips of ammunition at the Germans, whether he hit them or not, as long as he fired, and uh, then throw his gun away and then beat it and hide the best he could. Then we changed our direction and ran into a uh, point blank into a machine gun, and it got three or four of us. And so we changed our direction again and ran into another machine gun. And uh, the third machine gun we ran into, we, we had lost about 15 men out of our group. None of us had been killed. And the farmer's wife couldn't keep up with us, so we stuck her in a clump of bushes, and she was wearing a white dress, uh, uh, yes, a white dress, and uh, I remember it was very hard to camouflage her. It, uh, after we had stuck her into these bushes and attempted to camouflage her, we could still see her a long ways away. I don't know what ever happened to her. I think she must have been killed. There were 15 Germans in this town. Decided the odds were too great against us, so we thought we'd let them go. We went down the road about three miles and uh, met a gendarme down there. We had previously sent the gendarmes out to contact the Americans and bring them back to this, to Varad. I had given them instructions, written instructions, to bring back any American that he saw. Uh, this gendarme that came down the road told us that a van had stopped in Varad. There was a uh, German major sitting up front in the van, and the back of the van was filled with German soldiers, and that there was a Frenchman driving the van, and that the Frenchman was, knew that we were down there and was going to stop if we held him up. So we waited for the van. The van came down the road and stepped out on the road with the carbine. Colonel Felix laid on the side of the road with a, with a grenade. Uh, the German major immediately got out and stuck his hands up in the air, so we stuck the gun in his back, told him to, ha to uh, give an order to the Germans in the back of the van to get out of the van with their hands behind their head and uh, leave their weapons in the van. He was quite surprised because he didn't, he didn't think that we knew that the soldiers in the back of the van. Well, the soldiers get out, we turned them over to the French, and the French did a job on them. And we continued down the road. And a few minutes later, we contacted the Americans, the first Americans. The gendarme had brought him back. The Americans were very skeptical at first. They thought they were running into a trap. And it took me about an hour to convince them that I was an American. Then we took the prisoners and started back for Anthony, where I was supposed to meet Captain Arad with the plans. I got back to Anthony, and I met Jean-Pierre, who came up to me crying. He uh, was one of our liaison agents. The first time I ever saw him crying in my life, he came up and kissed me on both cheeks. and. Uh, uh, I finally got him calmed down, and here's the story he told me. He told me that Captain Arad had came down the back road as previously planned, but he had put on his uniform uh, for the first time in, in, in three months because he thought the Americans were in the area. Well, what had happened, they came down the road and heard some tanks coming up and thought they were American tanks, so waved them down, and three German Tiger tanks rolled up to a stop, and everybody jumped out and uh, were going to kill him there. So he put his hands up in the air, and. Uh, and stood there with his hands up in the air and nonchalantly gave the Germans hell for taking uh, his weapons away and uh, told them that they were crazy, they didn't know what they were doing, that he was a, a militian working with them and that he'd been working with them for four years. And by some miracle, I don't know how it happened, there's no explanation for it, they just left him there, standing there with his hands up, walked back to the tanks, got in and drove off. And about three minutes later, made contact with some American tanks and a, quite a battle followed. And in the battle, this uh, raison agent thought that Captain Arad had got killed. But uh, before, before they had split up, Captain Arad had given him the plan, so the plans were in our possession. So 
To make a long story short, as soon as we showed the plans to uh, Colonel Reed, who was commanding the uh, uh, 2nd Cavalry, he immediately took us back to 8th Corps. It took about, uh, about 24 hours to get back to 8th Corps. As soon as we got back to 8th Corps, I turned the plans over to some general, I forgot his name, and G2, who, who was Colonel Reeves, uh, immediately photospatted the, the, uh, the copy of the plans and uh, sent me up the 3rd Army with the plans. I brought the plans up the 3rd Army and, were taking them to, and was taking the plans to, to uh, General Patton when I met uh, Colonel Powell, who was uh, an SFHQ detachment uh, attached to 3rd Army. So he took me in hand and, and made all the necessary arrangements to have the plans turned over. Well, we stayed there for a couple of days, and uh, I, was, I was very much in a hurry to get back to my area, since I thought at this time that Captain Arad had been killed, and, and I was very much concerned about that. Well, in the second day, General Patton, uh, through Rip Powell, asked us how many men we had down there organized and not armed, and we told him 5,000. Well, he asked us if we could do a, a job for him, if, if he armed us, if we could hold his right flank, if he swung uh, towards Paris. So we told him yes. He immediately armed our men, 2,500 of our men, and, uh, and I infiltrated back through the lines and uh, found that Captain Arad was all right, the radio, op radio operator was all right, and we uh, made the necessary arrangements to receive the, the arms of 2,500 men. And uh, make a long story short, we held uh, this flank until uh, the 20th of August when we received a, a cable uh, through a messenger from London. It was a message sent to us by General Coney who wanted us to return to uh, London for a second mission. So uh, we left Colonel Felix in charge of the troops that were holding the right flank, and we went back to London. Uh, on returning to London, we found out that uh, uh, our second mission was to go into Paris, but it was a little too late. So on the 7th of September, we were re-parachuted into the center of France on another mission, a mission called the Mission Chinoise. It was a Jed uh, mission, but we also went in with two, uh, two agents. Our mission was to organize all the FFI in the departments that were already organized and those that were not organized, that we were to form them into mobile groups and attack the enemy wherever he went. Well, we hacked away at this division in the middle of France until they gave up. Remember, a division gave up to the 83rd Division? Well, we were hacking away at the uh, lower part of that division when it gave up. Uh, after they had given up, and I'm just going over this very briefly, this second mission, because uh, it's uh, similar to the second one. Uh, after they had given up, we, um, we had to change directions. That is, there were no Germans in the center of France in our immediate vicinity. So we received instructions from London uh, to turn around and come back towards the west coast, that is, towards saint Isaiah. At saint Isaiah, there were 27,000 Germans holding out. And at La Rochelle, there were about 20,000. So we organized all, we got them all together and moved approximately uh, 8,000 FFI from the center of France up south of the River Loire at saint Isaiah. Uh, then we, uh, or we um, combined our forces with those of the Loire and Ferriard, and we were we had approximately 20,000, about 20,000 FFI holding in uh, 27,000 Germans at St. Isaiah. And we held them from uh, uh, late September until uh, uh, the latter part of November. Uh, many incidents happened in the meantime. Uh, I don't think I should go into detail about them, except for one. I think uh, one is quite interesting. Uh, in the meantime, we had contacted Knight Army and we're working under General Simpson. Uh, he had given us a jeep. We had contacted Major Shellcross, who was an SFHQ detachment attached to the 9th Army. We were working uh, with very close connection with very close with the 94th Division. Well, we had three machine guns mounted on this jeep, and we used to run into a town and shoot up the town if it was filled with Germans, and then get out fast, and uh, and we always got by with it. So, when moving from the center of France up to uh, St. Isaiah, we were more or less the advanced uh, scouts, if you want to call it that. Uh, we were moving, we moved up to a little uh, town by the name of Pornik, and 
inquired if there were any Germans in Potomac, and they said uh, the uh, Frenchmen around there said that there were a few, very few uh, Germans there. So we decided to go down into the town and see what there was, and if we ran into any any uh, Germans, well, we'd shoot them up and try to get out. Well, on entering the town, there's a stretch of road about 500 yards. We came down this stretch of road, and just as we were entering the town, there was a roadblock. And uh, about 100 yards away from this roadblock, uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, stepped out about uh, 30 or 40 Germans with armed with machine guns, submachine guns, and rifles, so that we were caught, uh, caught cold. We couldn't turn around and make a run for it because we had 500 yards to go, and they would have cut us to ribbons if we did that. And before we could stop, we were about 50 yards from them. But I stopped the Jeep, we got out of the Jeep, and stood looking at one another at 50 yards away for about five minutes. It was, a, it was a, quite a situation. We just stood there looking at one another, no one doing any shooting. Uh, finally, I came to my senses, I guess. I had a white uh, parachute, piece of a parachute around my neck, and I took it out and waved it a couple of times, and uh, a German came out from behind the roadblock with a white handkerchief, and I met him halfway, and, uh, and I didn't know what to say, so I asked him to surrender the town to us. And uh, he said that he couldn't do that without permission from his sergeant. So uh, he went back to get the sergeant, and the sergeant was a pretty tough bully. He came down, and I was wearing green glasses, and he jerked the glasses off my face and uh, ordered us to come over and back to the blockade. Well, I couldn't speak German, he couldn't speak French or English, but the, I had a French major with me, and the major could speak English, and uh, could speak German, so he was interpreting for me, and I told this French major to tell him that I was an American officer and he'd better watch out. And he immediately stood at attention, handed me my glasses, and said he was sorry. Uh, so I asked him to surrender the, the town to, me, to us, and um, he said he didn't want to, he said he wanted to fight, and let's fight. Well, we didn't have anything to fight him with. There were three of us and about uh, maybe 150 of them all together, with what was in town, and uh, they had the drop on us, so I asked him to see his commanding officer immediately. So he went back to call up his commanding officer. Well, he called up his commanding officer. The commanding officer was quite a ways away and couldn't be down for... Uh, it would take about uh, an hour before he could get down. So he asked us if we'd wait, and so we said, okay. In the meantime, about 80 Germans came out, two and three at a time, uh, and we had a carton of cigarettes, luckily, and we gave them a cigarette apiece and shook hands and patted each other on the back and talked over the war situation and, and uh, tried to talk them out or tried to talk them into surrendering. Fifty percent of them would, were willing to give up. We didn't have the transportation to take them out. We, could, uh, we talked them out of it pretty easily. Some of them were Russian, some of them Polacks, and some of them thorough Germans. Uh, we gave them the argument that uh, uh, we were just small men in this affair and that uh, we could easily kill one another and it wouldn't amount to anything, but the men that were actually causing this war would live afterwards and so on and so on, and they agreed with us. One thing uh, <coughs> in particular they disliked was the English. They said if we were English, they would kill us immediately, that they had no use for the English and one thing or another. Well, anyway, in about an hour and a half, everybody stood at attention and Zeke Heil and uh, a lieutenant colonel came down the road. Lieutenant colonel and, uh, and a lieutenant, no blip. Uh, the old uh, spoke fluent English. He was a sort of a wimmy guy, I mean, just a little insignificant, uh, fragile-looking man. And in perfect English, he walked up and said, my chief wants to know what you're doing here, who sent you, and uh, what do you intend to do, and so on and so on. And I told him that a uh, general had sent me, and uh, we, wanted, we were Americans and didn't want to come down and kill him uselessly, and uh, he wanted to know if they'd surrender to us tonight. And then he, the uh, Oblutnant repeated it to um, the colonel, and the colonel said something to the Oblutnant. The Oblutnant said to my colonel, my chief tells me to tell you to shut up, that he doesn't want to hear any of this talk, to, uh, to uh, go back and tell your general to uh, come down and get him if he wants to, that we've been waiting for him for a long time, and if he thinks that he can take us, well, come and get us. Uh, actually, uh, no general had sent me. I wasn't from a general, but I was pulling that bluff at the time. Uh, well, to make a long story short, we shook hands, swapped cigarettes, saluted, trembling legs walked back to the Jeep. And they didn't shoot us or take us prisoners. As we got into the Jeep, a Frenchman came up and said, are you Mr. Paul? And I said, yes. I was going by the name of Mr. Paul around there. And, and uh, he said, I've got something to tell you, but I can't tell you right now. So we met him down around the bend, and he said, look, uh, this Oblutnant Schroeder, that was the Oblutnant's name, uh, he's willing to talk turkey with you, but uh, he couldn't say anything in front of the colonel. So uh, I made arrangements to meet this Oblatnant that night down on, uh, on the seashore, down by La Bernerie. And he didn't show up that night, but I met him the next night. 
He came out in civilian clothes, and we took him back to our headquarters uh, with his girlfriend. He was going with a French girl, and she always acted as, uh, as uh, his safe girl. That is, uh, she always came out and checked to see that I was alone before he would come out. Well, he came out. We brought him back to our headquarters. We sat down, had a good meal, drank wine, one thing or another. After supper, he pulled out plans, gave us all complete military information of all his sector, down to the machine gun. And it checked exactly with the information that we'd got that we had received from our agent, so he wasn't giving us false dough. Well, this went on for two or three nights, and uh, then the Frenchman that had come in with me got scared and figured this man was a super spy playing a double game, trying to play a game with us, but actually was playing against us. Well, I couldn't quite see it, but uh, they said if you go down and pick him up tonight and either kill him or bring him back a prisoner. So I went down, picked him up at usual, and brought him back, and. Uh, told him that he was my prisoner. If he tried to get away, we'd have to kill him. And he gave me a stiff argument. This is about 9 o'clock at night, and by 4 in the morning, I had convinced the Frenchman that we should give him a chance anyway and try him, because he couldn't really do us any harm. He didn't know too much about us. He'd come back to our headquarters. He knew where it was, but I'm sure that he knew where it was before, because uh, some French were playing a double game. That is, they'd spy for us and spy for the other side. You had to be careful who you were using for agents. Uh, So about 4 o'clock in the morning, after arguing from 9 to 4, they decided to let him to play ball with him. So we were going to give him a chance to prove himself. So we took him into this room and said, OK, Schroeder, uh, we're going to let you go. He was very happy and said, uh, here's what we're going to give you to prove yourself. Tomorrow, you send 10 Germans out from Pornic, where you're staying, to La Bernerie and from La Bernerie to Arcton. And while they're on that road, we'll ambush them somewhere. And so 3 o'clock next afternoon, just like murder, they, ten Germans walking down the middle of the road in a column of two, so we knocked out four of them, the first, the first shot, and the others gave up. So then we took the, took these uh, prisoners up to General Maloney, who was uh, commanding the 94th Division in Mount. In the meantime, his commanding officer had forced him to send out a patrol of 60 men to look for the ten men who had disappeared in thin air, and um, we didn't have time to lay an ambush. And the uh, result, we didn't get all of them. They killed about uh, five of us, and, and uh, we killed about 20 of them, and got a couple of, uh, wounded a few, and some of them got away. Uh, to make a long story short, this guy played with us all the time. Uh, one Saturday night, about 6 o'clock, I received a letter from him uh, in which he stated that uh, 6 o'clock the next morning he was going to attack on a depth of uh, 10 miles, but on a on a frontage of uh, 20 miles and occupy the following points, and that he himself wasn't actually going to lead the attack, and he wanted us to set out ambushes in certain places and so on and so on. And at 6 o'clock the next morning, he came out. Uh, the Germans came out exactly as he said they would on the very roads, and we ambushed them and, and, uh, and killed a lot of them, and they killed a few of us, but they, were, they, were, they came out in a very strong force, and they did occupy the points that they were... Uh, that they, um, they occupied their objectives. Well, here's the reason why this, this uh, lieutenant was playing this way. His father, was a, his father was a German, and his mother was a South American. I think she came from Chile. Uh, he, had been, he had lived in South America most of his life and had been in the Merchant Marines for a long time, and when war broke out, he was in Germany, and he was forced into the Navy and uh, given a commission. And uh, his boat had been sunk, and so all these Navy men were on land acting as uh, ground troops. And what he wanted to do was to get a clear passport back to South America with no strings attached, which I promised him if he'd play ball with us, and that's how we played ball with him. Now, I left, I left the area of St. Nazaire uh, about two weeks ago, and we had a telephone line running from his side of the line to our side of the line, so that when he intended to do something, uh, launch an attack, he just called us up and told us about it. Sounds quite fantastic, nevertheless, it's, it's true. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, well, that takes care of his little stories. As far as I know, he's still working. One time, uh, we had uh, some, we had taken some of their prisoners and we swapped them for our prisoners. And uh, when, our, when the German prisoners were turned back in, the, in exchange for, for, for uh, French prisoners, uh, they said that uh, Oblet and Schreider had been working with us. Some FFI had shot his mouth off to the prisoners, uh, bragging that, that one of them was working with us. So it uh, put a lot of pressure on him. The colonel started watching him. So then some of our men were 
some SFIs were captured, and they told the general on the other side that the, that the uh, lieutenant colonel was playing with us, so the general started watching the lieutenant colonel and took the pressure off from the, the old blood and Schreider so he could work with us again. <laughs> well, at this time, we had about 20,000 FFI holding in these Germans at St. Nazaire. And uh, General de Lamina, who was uh, General de Gaulle's second in command, was, took charge of all the western coast, that is, of St. Nazaire and of La Rochelle, and uh, Schaaf, uh, through his request, Schaaf, Schaaf pulled us in from the field, and uh, he made a, a large request to Schaaf for arms to arm all these Frenchmen, and uh, as far as I know, at this moment, they're either holding or planning an attack against St. Nazaire or La Rochelle. Then I returned to, uh, returned to Paris, and from Paris uh, to London, where I made a report, and uh, that's all. <laughs>